Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for our third Lessons with Leaders uh, from the, uh, sponsored by the uh, MBA Alumni Forum here at Sonoma State University. Um, my name is Sarani Kwan. I'm the chairman of the committee and uh, very happy to be introducing our speaker tonight. Uh, well, I actually had the pleasure of having him speak to our class and, and Professor Gerling's uh, class uh, on sustainability. So I was thrilled when we uh, got the okay that he was going to come back and speak to you all. I think you're going to really enjoy the talk. I don't know about you all, but my cupboard is full of traditional medicinal teas. In fact, I have two cases of the throat coat. So let me just do a quick introduction of Blair and we'll get started. So compelled to apply his talents in business to products he deeply believes in, Blair Kellison came to Traditional Medicinals in May of 2008, the company's 34th year, as its CEO, taking the reins from the co-founder, Drake Sadler, for the first time since Traditional Medicinals was founded in 1974. I didn't realize they had been around that long, but I guess I forgot that. Blair is a former CPA with Ernest & Young, a brand manager with Nestle, and received his MBA from the University of Chicago. In 1995, Blair made the best decision of his career by taking a 70% pay cut and trading in his brand manager position at Nestle for a business, product position, business development position at the mission-driven vegetarian food company called Fantastic Foods in Petaluma, California. Anyone uh, recognize that name? Yes. <laughs> Their um, falafels mix is the best. Over the past 20 years, Blair has been the first non-founder CEO of four companies. Each of these positions have been in the natural foods industry where he has applied his education and work experience to lead mission-driven natural organic companies into the mainstream, enabling their brands to reach a much wider audience. He believes true sustainability requires environmental, social, and financial sustainability. Mr. Kellison is a co-chair of the North Bay FIG, the food industry group, and he lives in Petaluma with his wife and two daughters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gosh, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> My story. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I want to uh, thank Professor Staten and um, Professor Gerling. As I have a dear uh, friendship with him for, for many years, and uh, anything he ever asks me to do, I always go do. And I was pleased to have me here today in the audience. So great to see you and Emery and Matt, two friends of mine. Nice to have you both here as well. And and uh, met a few of you on the way in. Met somebody who did a case study on traditional medicinals. And so anyway, it's, it's been an enjoyable experience. Um, just this, thank you so much. I, I hope uh, somebody here appreciates uh, what I have to say as much as I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you today. So um, I'll do I'll do my best to. Uh, educate you, inspire you, motivate you, some of those things. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Traditional Medicinals. So this is a throat coat, one of our popular products. We're over in, uh, really by the town of Grayton, but in the, uh, with a Sebastopol address. And uh, like the introduction said, I've been there for the last eight years. So it's been a wonderful experience. Um, and and uh, what I thought I'd do is just try to, not so much talk about myself, but just talk about the things. I, I'm 55 years old, so I've been working for 30-ish years and just try to give you a few lessons that I've learned over the years for, for, for what that's worth. Um, life is short. You hear that your whole life. Life is short. Life is short. You know what? Careers are really long. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to work about 50 years probably, 45 to 50 years. So I've been very fortunate to enjoy my, my work life and have found a tremendous amount of happiness in it. And what I wanted to do is just kind of tell you that story today of how, of how that came to be. Um, when I took one of my first, uh, when I took this job at Fantastic Foods that, the, that they referred to in the introduction, um, my mom sent me this card and it was a little guy, it was a little watercolor, a little guy on a bike jumping over a canyon and it said, uh, no guts, no story. Mm. So I have never, uh, I don't have any patents, I have never developed an app, I have never done any software, never taken a company public, but I got a story. So I appreciate, I appreciate that, that you guys want to hear it a little bit. I was once uh, an MBA just like you, went to University of Chicago. I was once young and promising just like all of you are. Um, and what I've kind of found is the, the magic in your career kind of happens when you're able to combine some education and some work experience and some passion and some hard work and a lot of help from others and some luck. 
and you kind of mix that all up together, and you know what? You can accomplish anything you set out to do. I, I am essentially an overachieving B student from Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> And, and I've had a wonderful career, and, and I will tell you that uh, I'm here because I'm the CEO of a local company, and that's the kind of people that that's the kind of people that people want to come and listen to talk to. But I can tell you that success in your own career has nothing to do with your title, and has nothing to do with how much money you make. So better to get that out now. And uh, those who don't believe me, when you're 55, you'll be like, "Yeah, that guy was right." <laughs> so uh, build your career around around happiness and around joy and around continuous learning and do not build your career around money and do not build it around titles and I can almost guarantee you um, you'll be very successful beyond your wildest dreams so for me according to to my level of success I've been successful beyond my wildest dreams I have a job I really love I work with people I really like I work in a community I really like I have a wonderful wife I have wonderful kids um, I, I, I just went camping with them for four days. It's just as joyful for me to do that as it is to lead my team at work. And, and it's all of that stuff together for me that's my definition of success. Also, whether you like it or not, uh, life, love, and leadership are as personal as you are. You can't be like anybody else but yourself. It's sort of one of life's injustices, but that, that's it. You only get to be yourself. And so you've got to figure out who you are, and from that, that's how you lead your life. That's how you lead your love, that's how you lead your leadership, and that's how you lead your career, and that's how you lead your relationship with your family. And, and all of that together, I think, is what, is what makes somebody successful. So, um, so how did this all happen for me? So, basically, uh, from the very beginning, uh, I just wanted to learn. So I, I was a first generation college graduate. So I went to college to get a job. So I picked accounting. That's a, that seemed like a, a, a profession you could get a job at. And so I, I majored in accounting at Indiana University and then I went to Chicago and I went to work at Ernst & Young. And I was a pretty good accountant. I scored in the top 8% of all the people ever took the CPA exam in the state of Indiana. Something impressive. I was a B student too. So, but why is that? I, because I think the greatest gift I was ever given in life is being a B student. As if you're a B student, there's always the A students ahead of you. You never, ever feel like you're the smartest person in the room. You always feel like everybody's smarter than you. And so because of that, I was always listening. And I was always trying to learn from others. I never thought I had it all figured out. I thought everybody else had it all figured out. And so um, the CPA exam is just a little example of that. One of my best friends, 3.9 student in, in uh, accounting, we went to, he went to work at Arthur Anderson, and we moved up to Chicago together, and I passed the CPA exam and he didn't, only because I studied more, because I worked harder. I wasn't smarter than him, I'll never be smart. He's still one of the smartest people I know. So, so it's, that, it's that combination of kind of hard work and passion, and, and so I got pretty good at accounting, I did a fun thing in the middle of my experience at Ernst Young. I decided I wanted to live in Sydney, Australia. So I was probably 26, well, it was, 20, it was 27. And the firm said, gee, if you're uh, in 10 years, if we think you want you to be a partner, we'll send you over there. We have a whole program for them. I'm like, I want to go now. They're like, well, we don't have a pro program for like 26 year olds to go to Australia. I said, okay, well, if I go over there and interview for a job, will you tell them I'm decent at my job? So I went to Sydney, Australia, on my own, interviewed with Ernst & Young, set up an appointment, got a job. <laughs> came, back, came back to the Chicago office and said, hey, I'm moving to Sydney. They're like, what? I said, well, I got a job at Ernst & Young. <laughs> I've heard, like years and years later, well, so then I did that for a year, then I came back and I said, then I called them up and said, hey, I want to come back. They're like, you know, so the point being, <laughs> I, I heard years later, people were like, I want to go on that Blair Kellison program. I was like, it's not a program. <laughs> we don't encourage it. So, but, but what I really learned there was, even in these big companies, you can be yourself. And you can try new things. And, um, and the, I tell you, the greatest thing that I learned when I went to Australia was I moved to this country where I didn't know anyone. And... It was, it was like, um, 
It was like looking down on your life. So I, 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 for a whole year, I didn't know anyone, even when I left in one year, the longest I'd known anyone in that country was one year, right? So you don't have any childhood friends. No one knows anything about you. You don't have any touchstones to your past. And so it forces you to really think about yourself and your life. And you know, I know uh, well, I'm in California now and people are very good at meditating and they're very good at, at, at transformational things of their mind. If you're from Indianapolis, Indiana, you can't do that. So. <laughs> so, so, but, I did, but I did it by moving to Australia. And the point I'm trying to make is you have to do things in life that, one, make you uncomfortable. Um, there's, a, there's a famous saying, the, the, the discomfort is the only sure way to, to increase your comfort zone. Right, and so you, you, so I was, so I had to learn, and I had to, uh, and I learned a lot about myself. And the real point I'm trying to make is, you need to do things that enable you to really learn who you are. Because if you really, really want to have this career and this life that really embodies who you are, gosh, you got to really get to know yourself, and you got to work at it. You got to find ways that maybe some people can't do it in their room, in their yoga room, and they can meditate. I did it by just putting myself in uncomfortable situations, and so. Um, anyway, that was probably too long a story about that, but then I, I went and got an MBA, decided that I, so this was interesting, I had this epiphany in Sydney, Australia, like, gosh, I don't even like accounting in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so I just, I, I, I uh, and, and, and so the, the two, so my dad's famous, I said, dad, I think I'm going to quit accounting and, and uh, get an MBA and go into marketing. And I was like, he's like, what do you think about that? He's like, son, you've just quit a job that's better than your dad ever gets got. So I'm done giving you career advice. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the point of that story really is, um, and this is really important, um, at this age, you're good at some things. You've had a job you, and you've gone back to school and, and there's some things that you're good at, right? It doesn't mean that that's what you love to do. And you... And so what happens, I see a lot in career. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for our third Lessons with Leaders uh, from the, uh, sponsored by the uh, MBA Alumni Forum here at Sonoma State University. Um, my name is Sarani Kwan. I'm the chairman of the committee and uh, very happy to be introducing our speaker tonight. Uh, well, I actually had the pleasure of having him speak to our class and, and Professor Gerling's uh, class uh, on sustainability. So I was thrilled when we uh, got the okay that he was going to come back and speak to you all. I think you're going to really enjoy the talk. I don't know about you all, but my cupboard is full of traditional medicinal teas. In fact, I have two cases of the throat coat. So let me just do a quick introduction of Blair and we'll get started. So compelled to apply his talents in business to products he deeply believes in, Blair Kellison came to Traditional Medicinals in May of 2008, the company's 34th year, as its CEO, taking the reins from the co-founder, Drake Sadler, for the first time since Traditional Medicinals was founded in 1974. I didn't realize they had been around that long. Well, I guess I forgot that. Blair is a former CPA with Ernst & Young, a brand manager with Nestle, and received his MBA from the University of Chicago. In 1995, Blair made the best decision of his career by taking a 70% pay cut and trading in his brand manager position at Nestle for a business, product position, business development position at the mission-driven vegetarian food company called Fantastic Foods in Petaluma, California. Anyone uh, recognize that name? Yes. <laughs> Their um, falafels mix is the best. Over the past 20 years, Blair has been the first non-founder CEO of four companies. Each of these positions have been in the natural foods industry where he has applied his education and work experience to lead mission-driven natural organic companies into the mainstream, enabling their brands to reach a much wider audience. He believes true sustainability requires environmental, social, and financial sustainability. Mr. Kellison is a co-chair of the North Bay FIG, the food industry group, and he lives in Petaluma with his wife and two daughters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gosh, that's it. I'm done. <laughs> My story. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I want to uh, thank Professor Satan and um, Professor Gerling. I uh, have a dear uh, friendship with him for, for many years, and uh, anything he ever asks me to do, I always go do. And I was pleased to have me here today in the audience. So great to see you and Emery and Matt, two friends of mine. Nice to have you both here as well. And and uh, met a few of you on the way in. Met somebody who did a case study on traditional medicinals. And so anyway, it's, it's been an enjoyable experience. Um, just this, thank you so much. I, I hope uh, 
Somebody here appreciates uh, what I have to say as much as I appreciate the opportunity to be able to talk to you today. So um, I'll, do, I'll do my best to uh, educate you, inspire you, motivate you, some of those things. Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Traditional Medicinals. So this is a throat coat, one of our popular products. We're over in, uh, really by the town of Grayton, but in the, uh, with a Sebastopol address. And uh, like the introduction said, I've been there for the last eight years. So it's been a wonderful experience. Um, and and uh, what I thought I'd do is just try to, not so much talk about myself, but just talk about the things. I, I'm 55 years old, so I've been working for 30-ish years and just try to give you a few lessons that I've learned over the years for, for, for what that's worth. Um, life is short. You hear that your whole life. Life is short. Life is short. You know what? Careers are really long. <laughs> You're going to work about 50 years, probably, 45 to 50 years. So I've been very fortunate to enjoy my, my work life and have found a tremendous amount of happiness in it. And what I wanted to do is just kind of tell you that story today of, of how that came to be. Um, when I took one of my first, uh, when I took this job at Fantastic Foods that, the, that they referred to in the introduction, um, my mom sent me this card, and it was a little guy, it was a little watercolor, a little guy on a bike jumping over a canyon, and it said, uh, no guts, no story. Mm -hmm. So I have never, uh, I don't have any patents, I have never developed an app, I have never done any software, never taken a company public, but I got a story. So I appreciate, I appreciate that, that you guys want to hear it a little bit. I was once uh, an MBA, just like you, went to University of Chicago, I was once young and promising, just like all of you are. Um, and what I've kind of found is the, the magic in your career kind of happens when you're able to combine some education and some work experience and some passion and some hard work and a lot of help from others and some luck. And you kind of mix that all up together. And you know what? You can accomplish anything you set out to do. I, I am essentially an overachieving B student from Indianapolis, Indiana. <laughs> and, and I've had a wonderful career. And, and I will tell you that uh, I'm here because I'm the CEO of a local company. And that's the kind of people that, that's the kind of people that people want to come and listen to talk to. But I can tell you that success in your own career has nothing to do with your title. And it has nothing to do with how much money you make. So better to get that out now. And uh, those who don't believe me, when you're 55, you'll be like, yeah, that guy was right. <laughs> so uh, build your career around, around happiness and around joy and around uh, continuous learning. And do not build your career around money and do not build it around titles. And I can almost guarantee you, um, you'll be very successful beyond your wildest dreams. So for me, according to, to my level of success, I've been successful beyond my wildest dreams. I have a job I really love. I work with people I really like. I work in a community I really like. I have a wonderful wife. I have wonderful kids. Um, I, I, I just went camping with them for four days. It's just as joyful for me to do that as it is to lead my team at work. And, and it's all of that stuff together for me that's my definition of success. Also, whether you like it or not, uh, life, love, and leadership are as personal as you are. You can't be like anybody else but yourself. It's sort of one of life's injustices, but that, that's it. You only get to be yourself. And so you've got to figure out who you are, and from that, that's how you lead your life. That's how you lead your love, that's how you lead your leadership, and that's how you lead your career, and that's how you lead your relationship with your family. And, and all of that together, I think, is what, is what makes somebody successful. So, um, so how did this all happen for me? So. Basically, uh, from the very beginning, uh, I just wanted to learn. So I, I was a first generation college graduate. So I went to college to get a job. So I picked accounting. That's a, that seemed like a, a, a profession you could get a job at. And so I, I majored in accounting at Indiana University. And then I went to Chicago and I went to work at Ernst & Young. And I was a pretty good accountant. I scored in the top 8% of all the people ever took the CPA exam in the state of Indiana. Something impressive. I was a B student too. So, but why is that? I, because I think the greatest gift I was ever given in life is being a B student. As if you're a B student, 
there's always the A students ahead of you. You never, ever feel like you're the smartest person in the room. You always feel like everybody's smarter than you. And so because of that, I was always listening. And I was always trying to learn from others. I never thought I had it all figured out. I thought everybody else had it all figured out. And so um, the CPA exam is just a little example of that. One of my best friends, 3.9 student in, in uh, accounting, we went to, he went to work at Arthur Anderson, and we moved up to Chicago together, and I passed the CPA exam, and he didn't. Only because I studied more. Because I worked harder. I wasn't smarter than him. I'll never be smart. He's still one of the smartest people I know. So, so it's, that, it's that combination of kind of hard work and passion. And, and so I got pretty good at accounting. I did a fun thing in the middle of my experience at Ernst & Young. I decided I wanted to live in Sydney, Australia. So I was probably... 26, well, it was, 20, it was 27, and the firm said, gee, if you're uh, in 10 years, if we think you want you to be a partner, we'll send you over there. And we have a whole program for them. I'm like, I want to go now. They're like, well, we don't have a pro program for like 26 year olds to go to Australia. I said, okay, well, if I go over there and interview for a job, will you tell them I'm decent at my job? So I went to Sydney, Australia, on my own. Interviewed with Ernst and Young, set up a set up a appointment, got a job. <laughs> <laughs> came back, came back to the Chicago office and said, "Hey, I'm moving to Sydney." They're like, "What?" I said, well, "I got a job at Ernst and Young." <laughs> I've heard like years and years later. Well, so then I did that for a year. Then I came back and I said, "Then I called them up and said, hey, I want to come back.'" They're like. You know, so the point being, <laughs> I, I heard years later, people were like, I want to go on that Blair Kellison program. It's like, it's not a program. <laughs> we don't encourage it. So, but, but what I really learned there was, even in these big companies, you can be yourself. And you can try new things. And, um, and the, I tell you, the greatest thing that I learned when I went to Australia was I moved to this country where I didn't know anyone. And... It was, it, was like, um, it was like looking down on your life. So I, 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 for a whole year, I didn't know anyone. Even when I left in one year, the longest I'd known anyone in that country was one year, right? So you don't have any childhood friends. No one knows anything about you. You don't have any touchstones to your past. And so it forces you to really think about yourself and your life. And you know, I know uh, well, I'm in California now and people are very good at meditating and they're very good at, at at transformational things of their mind. If you're from Indianapolis, Indiana, you can't do that. So, <laughs> so, so but, I did, but I did it by moving to Australia. And the point I'm trying to make is you have to do things in life that one, make you uncomfortable. Um, there's, a, there's a famous saying, the, the, the discomfort is the only sure way to, in, to increase your comfort zone, right? And so you, you, so I was, so I had to learn and I had to uh, and I learned a lot about myself. And the real point I'm trying to make is you need to do things that enable you to really learn who you are. Because if you really, really want to have this career and this life that really embodies who you are, gosh, you've got to really get to know yourself. And you've got to work at it. You've got to find ways that maybe some people can't do it in their room, in their yoga room, and they can meditate. I did it by just putting myself in uncomfortable situations. And so um, anyway, that was probably too long a story about that. But then I, I went and got an MBA, decided that I, so this was interesting. I had this epiphany in Sydney, Australia, like, gosh, I don't even like accounting in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and so I just, I, I, I uh, and, and, and so the, the two, so my dad's famous, I said, dad, I think I'm going to quit accounting and, and uh, get an MBA and go into marketing. And I was like, he's like, what do you think about that? He's like, son, You've just quit a job that's better than your dad ever gets got. So I'm done giving you career advice. <laughs> so, but the point of that story really is, um, and this is really important. Um, at this age, you're good at some things. You've had a job, you, and you've gone back to school, and, and there's some things that you're good at, right? It doesn't mean that that's what you love to do. And you, you and so what happens? I see a lot in career. Um, that, so, so that's that's the mix there, and so. It's a really important lesson to like, don't do things just because you're good at it. Do things because you really love it. So that's, that's a really, that, that derails a lot of people in their careers. Well, uh, you know, I worked for this insurance company, I got my MBA, and I'm going to go back to the insurance company. God, they offered me the most money. So uh, that, that's not, not, not the way to do it. So I'll tell you, um, my, 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 so I went to work at Nestle, go to, so now I moved to Los Angeles. 
Don't know anybody in Los Angeles? Go to work for Nestle in Glendale. Another life experience. Now I'm 30 years old and I'm, I'm living in Los Angeles and I, I have a brand new career at 30. My boss was 26 years old, <laughs> you know, but I had never been in marketing, right? She'd been in marketing for four years. So um, th that was a whole life experience for me. And then, uh, so uh, referring to my introduction, so the best thing that ever happened to me, the best career move I ever made was I went shopping at the 19th Street Natural Foods Co-op in Santa Monica, California, and I walked into the store and saw all these wonderful, healthy, mission-driven companies, products that I'd never heard of before, and I was borderline becoming a vegetarian at the time, became a vegetarian, and started shopping at this, paid my $100 and joined the co-op. I remember writing that check, and boy, that changed my entire trajectory of my life, that one, that one moment, and started uh, uh, buying Amy's Pot Pies. I think they only had two products then. They had a pot pie and a mac and cheese, and uh, started buying Fantastic Foods, which made all kinds of the tofu, tofu scramble and veggie burgers, and anyway, so I started, and, and, then, and then, I, then I stopped eating anything Nestle made. So here I am, this MBA marketing guy working at the big world's largest food company, and I don't eat anything they make except Butterfingers. They're pretty good. <laughs> um, we make candy now. We have seven flavors. That's right. That's right. So. <laughs> but it was a real epiphany, and I was like, "Wow, I'm, I'm spending all my days working for a company whose products I don't even like." And so one night, I I literally took all these products off my shelf in my cabinet. Put them all out on the counter. This was like Spectrum Oils, uh, uh, um, Amy's, and uh, Fantastic Foods, a couple other companies in the area. And I, I uh, saw that they were all, I, I saw, they were from all over the place, but I saw that like seven or eight of them were from Sonoma County. So I thought, gosh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go talk to these companies. And so I wrote down the names of all the companies, called on the phone, back when there, you know, you had to call people on the telephone to find information. <laughs> and, and couldn't Google them. Google wasn't around yet. And, um, and my, my eight-year-old asked me that. They go, what did you do when you Googled stuff as a kid? How did you do it? I'm like, hard <laughs> 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 concept to explain. That was right after we changed the channel manually on the TV. Right? <laughs> so, um, um, but I, I, and I asked who the president of the companies were. And I wrote all the presidents, uh, wrote the presidents of seven companies in Sonoma County. And I said, hey, I'm, I'm this guy who's... Who, who eat your products, and I think they're incredibly high quality, and your mission is fantastic. And, um, and I bet you're not so good at sales, marketing, distribution, finance, logistics. And I said, I work at a food company that makes pretty marginal products, and we're damn good at sales, marketing, logistics, and finance. If I came to Petaluma, California, um, at the end of a day, um, would you have 10 minutes to talk to me about how I could possibly get into the natural foods industry? And I, and I, and I came to Petaluma and I met Andy Berliner before they, they were pouring the concrete on the first plant. This is 1994. So Andy and Rachel Berliner had me in their house on D Street. Uh, you know, and, and, and anyway, and, uh, and Jim Rosen at Fantastic Foods and Jethro at Spectrum Oils and, and anyway, had this wonderful, incredible day. And, um, Seven of the eight people offered me a job. Wow. <laughs> now, the moral of that story is, this is going back to the pay cut, if you're relatively smart and you're incredibly enthusiastic and you're willing to work for a really low wage, there's a lot of opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, but you know what, all of a sudden I was, I was, uh, all of a sudden I was um, 34 years old, been working for about 12 years, um, with my MBA and my CPA, and I'm making an all-time low salary. But God damn, I was so happy. I was a vegetarian selling <laughs> veggie burgers. <laughs> and I was damn enthusiastic about it. And, and I just, I, I couldn't get enough of it. I mean, I just was so, I, I was like, wow, this is what it's like to really love what you do for a living. Jim Rosen, the owner company, is still a very dear friend of mine. I'm, president of his fan club for life, and he's president of mine. He's so proud of me, because he offered me that job, and look, and I spent 20 years in the natural foods industry as a result of it, and, and so um, it was really, really wonderful. Um, and then I, so I really got the bug, and then, um, then I got a little ahead of myself, and decided to start my own natural foods company. And 
that's a long story, but the bottom, the, the, the moral of that story, well, no, there's no moral in that story, I don't think. I lost all my money, lost all my IRAs and all my money I had. And uh, so now I'm 37, 38 years old, and I'm, uh, I sold my company, we're, we're not doing very well. So I worked for the world's largest food company and officially the world's smallest food company. <laughs> um, and so I had this moment in my life when I um, was living in uh, Oakland, and uh, I went to the Safeway, and I went to the ATM before I went to the Safeway to get $20 out to try to get something to eat. And it said I couldn't get any money out of my account because I only had $7.60, $17.60 in my account, and the minimum withdrawal was $20 at the ATM. And at 37 years old, that was literally all I had to my name. I cashed in all my, and my Subaru was about it. And I had to call my parents and ask them for some rent money and I put a suit on and I took the BART to downtown San Francisco and I went to account temps. And I took the accountant test. They all have to do whether you're a CPA or not, you have to take the test. And I passed the test and I started doing temp work in accounting at 38 years old that other people were doing at 22 years old and probably people without college degrees were doing. <clears throat> and just got myself back on my feet. And then I found this consulting, a friend of mine called me and said, hey Blair, I, I found a consulting job and um, it's, it's like this nutritional supplement, it's like your people, not my people. <laughs> <laughs> it was down in Mountain View. So I went there and I, and I did this consulting project for like two months. The company it was called Daily Wellness. Uh, they made these little uh, products in the little, <laughs> little bottle. Uh, dietary, it was a liquid dietary supplement, and they'd lost nine million. The investors had lost nine million dollars over a period of like five years, and I wanted to know where the hell the money went. So I spent uh, spent something like eight weeks there, and which was great. I was getting paid, you know, and um, and so there was a big uh, conference room, and there was two big whiteboards, and so I had to give my presentation, and I gave it on a whiteboard, and I basically laid out for the board uh, how they lost. The whole nine million dollars. Every generally, you know, the big buckets where it all went. So it was this whole board, okay? And then um, I sit down, and the board is stunned. You know, some some Silicon Valley people and stuff because it was down Mountain View. And this is where you got to take initiative in life. And I popped up and I said, "You know what I'd do if I were you?" They were like, "What?" I filled the whole other whiteboard with what I would do. One of the board members got up drew a big circle around the whole thing. He said, would you be president of that if we hired you? That's how I got my first president job. <laughs> That's how I got the job, just taking that initiative. Wow. And so um, I became president of a company called The Daily Wellness. And it was a pretty crappy company, losing a lot of money. So it's, it's that Woody Allen saying, I don't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member. Well, you know, it's kind of how it goes. When, who wants a CEO of a company that's never been a CEO of a company? Well, that, that company. <laughs> <laughs> but it was an incredible learning experience. I'm still friends with some of those people to this day. We really turned it around from losing a lot of money to making some money. Uh, it was a long, long way from home for me. It was almost a two-hour commute. And, um, and so I started, uh, and so there was an opportunity for another job up in, up in more my way that was a marketing job. And I thought, gosh, I got to get out of this commute. And I've got to kind of get my career back on track. I got to get back into marketing. And, and so I interviewed for a marketing job. At a, at, a, at a health publishing company, and in the interview, uh, the guy said, you know, we're also looking for a CEO. I think you should apply for the CEO job. So I came back and went and interviewed with somebody else for the CEO job, and it was a guy who was the president of Ziff Davis. I don't know if you guys know Ziff Davis, but that used to yeah. be a big deal. It was by a $300 million tech publishing company, and, and Scott Briggs basically started it and ran it, and he's, he's a big deal in that world. And, um, and he offered me the job and I got it. Now I'm running a company with like 40 people and a publishing, we had books and magazines. And about six months after I took that job, I was, felt like I was doing okay. I had breakfast with Scott one day and I said, I gotta ask you this question. Why did you hire me? I had no publishing experience. I've only been CEO of a company for like one year. He said, oh yeah, I was waiting for you to ask me that one day. <laughs> he said, you spent your whole interview telling me what you didn't know how to do and what you needed to learn. He said, that was what you focused your whole interview on. And he goes, I know all I was worried about was because of your life to be a cowboy and think you had it all figured out. And when you told me, when you had that, that humble attitude towards it all, 
I knew you were a leader, and I knew that I could fill in the gaps in the publishing, and that's why I hired you. That's why you're doing such a great job. Oh. So again, just kind of an interesting little, little careers are this whole mix of things. I don't know, it's hard to, hard to describe it all. And, 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 uh, uh, but that's kind of how that goes, and, and, and uh, that's how I kind of got going. And so, gosh, for the last 20, you know, last 20 years from veggie burgers to tea, there's a lot more stories in between there. I, I won't go into them, but I just wanted to make some points that, that it, it just, when you get an MBA or when you get out of college, you want to know what the whole future is. You want to have it all laid out for you, right? I can tell you if it was all laid out for you, you wouldn't get out of bed tomorrow. It, it, it's all twists and turns and you got to be listening and you got to tune into it and you, you, you got to uh, I met my wife in Los Angeles at a time when neither of us were living there on an Avis rental car bus <laughs> because I because I struck up a conversation with her that has led to a 20-year relationship with her and two kids and a wonderful marriage like life is right there it's right there you just have to engage with it and that's the point I'm trying to make about all of this is just engage with it and so I guess I'm trying to say, like, how's that apply? You know, I'm hoping this is a, you're looking at it applying to you, but you've already started on a career to success. You've, you've got a lot of building blocks already. Um, here's one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given in life. Uh, it, 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 on Friday, every Friday when you get paid, you actually get two paychecks. One is money and one is experience. And make sure you always pick the paycheck with the greatest experience. The money will follow the experience, this, this mix of education and experience and passion and persistence is that mix, right? You, it's, did I ever mention the word money? That is not an element of success. An element of success is being able to dictate what you want to do, where you want to do it, who you want to do it with, and that's all about your ability to work. And your ability to work has nothing to do with how much money you make, it has to be with what you can do when you show up at your job. And the more experiences you have, the harder your jobs are, the more you learn, the more you have the ability to dictate your own future. <clears throat> your own future. And so that's why that is really, they've done all these studies on su successful people. And one of the number one things that always shows up is people who are continuous learners. So do not ever think that when you graduate from your MBA program, you are done learning. You are learning your, your whole life. So um, also I think you need to have a little patience in your career. So I did some things when I was younger, worked in an accounting firm, some of it was boring, some of it was pretty corporate, did the same thing at Nestle, but you know, I did that for 10 years. And now 30 years later, 20 years later, I'm using those experiences to run a company. And what if I was impatient and I didn't spend the, the time at Ernst What if I was impatient and I didn't spend the time at the Nestle? I wouldn't know all those things. And so I don't even know how people who don't have those experiences do it because I only know how to do it from those experiences. So I think that's an important one. Um, I think another couple of things that happen, whether you like it or not, but from about 22 to 30 to 32, your success in your career is all about you. You go to work at a company and you work really hard and you get really good work done. And that's what determines how good you are and what you get paid and what your title is. And then all of a sudden in your early 30, early 30s, it all becomes about what what you can do through others. It's a huge transition that you have to make. It is no, you, you could work, you could be the smartest person in the world and you could work 80 hours a week. That's minuscule. I, got a, I, work, I have 170 people at our company that are working every day trying to grow that company. I can't work those kind of hours. I can't do that. I don't have the skills that they all have. And so your career becomes much more about what you can get done. And also when you go to interview, it becomes more about, hey, I'm going to pay you $100,000. What are you going to do? And, and what one great experience at, at Fantastic Foods. So Jim Rosen, the founder, was a Montessori school teacher. That was his experience before he started that food company. And uh, so I, I, I'm getting ready to start. It was maybe it was a, a couple of days before I started. He said, he said hey, um, you, you got one of those MBAs, right? I said, yeah. He goes, from one of those schools people think are really good, too. I go, well, yeah, I'd like to think so. And he said, uh, I'd appreciate it if you had never mentioned that at work. Because most of the people who work here never went to college. Wow. That was an incredible learning for me. Because what that told me was, it is not, when you work at Nestle, you're Blair, you're from Chicago, you're Martin, Darden, you're somebody else, so no mistake. You're, you're, you're your school, that's like, you're part of your identity of working there. And he was like, wipe it clean. You're coming here, we're going to pay you a wage, and what are you going to do? And that was a really great, really great moment of, of learning for me for, for that. So, um... 
find your passion, not what you're good at, but find what you really like to do. Um, hopefully, and, and you'll be good at that too. You'll be best at what you like to do. Um, live a balanced life, family and friends, spouses, all that kind of things. Make time for a lot. I have a lot of mentors in life. Almost all, I've never heard a mentor tell me, uh, gosh, I wish I would have worked more. They all tell me I wish I would have spent more time with my family. Um, you, you don't have to be a CEO to be successful, but you're all CEO of your life. So you should have a strategic plan. You should be thinking about who you are, getting to know yourself, who do you want to be. That should be the filter that you put, that you put opportunities through. And you should have your own board of directors. You need a lot of advisors around you. And I think that's really uh, good. Good people give good advice and bad people give bad advice. You have to try to figure out the two. Unfortunately, that can be a little bit hard. A couple of pieces of advice on, on job seeking. Don't ever apply for 50 jobs. Apply for five jobs. Research the companies, figure out what they're all about, figure out why you fit that position, write a cover letter that says how your whole entire life has led you to this job and why you will be successful. And if you're in an interview, be able to answer why did you choose this profession, why are you choosing this job, and why are you choosing this company. And when somebody asks you at the end of an interview, do you have any questions, you better have lots. Because you are a really smart person, you have a lot to offer. You have to interview them. They'll be, they're just as fortunate to have you bring your bag of talents there as they are to be able to, to, to hire you. So that's really important. Um, jobs you'll love. There's not a subcategory for that on LinkedIn. Most jobs you love are not uh, ones you apply for. They're ones you create. You can make any ordinary job extraordinary. I came to Fantastic Foods. I don't even know what my, my job was when I started there. I just kept taking on more and more and more and more and more. And that's what made it so exciting. And, and I can tell you, every company is full, everybody's works, everybody's place full. If you're willing to take work off other people's plates and take on more responsibility, it's there for you. And, and so I think that's really good. Um, we talked a lot about getting to know yourself. That's really personal qualities, most important quality you can have. And if there's a test for this, it was the only thing I would do in an interview is humility. If you are humble, then you know you don't have it all figured out. If you know you don't have it all figured out, you're going to be trying to figure it out. If you're trying to figure it out, you're learning. You know what happens when you learn? You realize more and more what you don't know. The more you realize what you don't know, the more you want to learn. So, so uh, by definition, people who are humble have an intellectual curiosity. So I think that's a really, really important uh, trait. The other one is engagement. Just really engage with people. People are, are just, people who engage with people go, go far. Kindness, you can never be too kind. Just be nice to everybody every day, everything you do, be as kind and nice as you can to everyone. And, and they will all come back to you and it will, it will bring you great joy. And people love to work with people who are appreciative, who are nice, who are kind. Um, I think that's really important. Throw in some hard work, patience, persistence, passion, little luck. You're going to do whatever you want to do. So, um, and just to conclude, nobody's got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. Um, we all make mistakes. You're going to make mistakes. Um, find people like me in your life. I've made a whole bunch of mistakes that you're getting ready to make. So learn from you know learn from people like me. It doesn't have to be a CEO. I can tell you anybody anybody from a 20 year old to a 70 year old can get can can you can learn from. You can learn from everybody. So everybody's made lots of mistakes. Um, you have, you're, you're in a great school, in a great program, you have incredible talents. Don't shortchange yourself by not reaching your full potential. And don't shortchange this life by you not reaching your full potential. You, you, you're, you really have everybody, every ability to. So, so I'm 55, it's probably sounding pretty old to you guys, I'm okay with that. Um, but I have a lot of wisdom, so I have that on you. And, and I've learned a few things, and, and I'm here tonight uh, away from my family and spend this time because I just want to share with you what I've learned. And I can tell you everybody in my position wants to share with others what they've learned. And, and so seek that advice from others. Um, and I know you want to have it all figured out. I can tell you the one sure thing, way leads to way. Everything leads to something else, to something else, to something else. And over the next months and years and decades of your life, you are going to create a beautiful mosaic which is going to be your life and just keep working on it every day. You don't have to have it all figured out. Just keep listening and learning and trying. And I, I, I trust you, trust me, it's gonna be a beautiful mosaic when it's all done. And it's gonna be your own beautiful, unique life. It's your life. It, you can't be like anybody else but yourself. Um, 
And, and you can listen to people like me, which is good, but at the end of the day, you have to do the hard work. And, and you have to get to know yourself. And you have to keep listening and learning. And, and uh, the last thing I like to say is, is um, every generation is sure that the generation after them is lazy, wouldn't know hard days <laughs> work, would fall on their head. Um, they're all self-centered. Um, there's a lot written about millennials. I can tell you it's almost exactly the same stuff that was written about in the 70s about the baby boomers. You're just the next generation that's, that's not good enough for the next, for the generation, that's not good enough to the generation that was before you. It couldn't be further from the truth. You are the greatest generation to ever live on planet Earth. You truly are. And, and uh, you have an awesome responsibility that comes with that. And you have, uh, the world is counting on you to reach your full potential and to really make the most of this world that, you, that you've, been given. You've, you've, been, you've been given this incredible education, this incredible nurturing, wonderful environment. And I just encourage you to, to make the very most of it. And that's my story. <laughs> And if a PE student from Indiana can do it, you can. <laughs> so I'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Or... I'm just yes. curious about the um, traditional medicinals and like how how do you come up with the different types of teas? Like, is that like a throw things up on the wall to see what sticks to say, oh, this is a cool tea, let's develop something like that? Yeah, you know, um, it's probably pretty similar to most consumer packaged goods. Companies, it's a marriage between your sort of product development. So at Amy's, it's more culinary people that are on food trends, what's going on in restaurants, and then um, marketing people that are looking at consumer insights. And so you've got sort of, so for us, it's our herbalists. They're the ones who are learning about, they're, they're always into all the herbs and what's going on, all the different conditions. And then on the other side, we've got the marketing people that are like, this is what's going on with natural foods and trends and clean eating or whatever those things are. So it's marrying <laughs> consumer insights with scientific information and, and kind of coming up with that. So we might have a, we might say, uh, we have a, a stress ease tea that we came out with a year ago. So a lot of consumer insights around, wow, you know, of all these health conditions, the one that shows up at the top all the time is stress. People are just stressed out. We need to make a tea that's just for stress. And so then, then you go to the herbalist and they're like, oh, we could use this herb and that herb and that herb. And then they, all of a sudden you come up with this tea, a uh, tea called stress ease. Wow. Yeah. How is it done? Oh, it's actually doing pretty well. <laughs> We've had our failures, but you know, we we did a we had a huge failure a couple years ago. We made this incredibly efficacious tea for women in, the, in menopause in their fifties. Um, but you know what? Women who are in their fifties who are having hot flashes don't really want to drink hot tea. <laughs> it was a huge failure. What's <laughs> your we have three teas that sell the most. We have this throw coat. We have a nursing tea called Mother's Milk. And then we have a, a laxative tea called Smooth Move. And the three of them are about a third of our business. So. You didn't bring any Smooth Move with you. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes? Is there an example that you can give? So I feel like there's a big shift here um, with sustainability for where maybe the business case wasn't there, but you still fought for the sustainability and the impact that it had on your footprint or the earth but maybe lost money on that, just because I feel like a lot of companies, like we just hired our first sustainability manager at Amy's last year, and we're being asked, we're at a point, I'm on a committee where we're gonna need to build some business cases. And I don't know if the money will always be in our favor, but that's a big part of it, ROI, so. Yeah, I'll start by being a little philosophical. The two greatest issues that you will hear about the rest of your life in, uh, on planet Earth are income inequality and climate change. There'll be no two greater issues that will dominate the press for the rest of your life. So your company, every company should be working to address both of those issues in some way or another, whether it's a loss or not. So I'll start by saying that. That's, a, I think, a, everybody's responsibility, particular corporations' responsibility is to address those two issues. So the way we look at it is we really look at it as an investment. So traditional medicinals buys 125 herbs from about 300 different farmers in uh, 35 countries on six continents. Most of those plants are grown in a region where, they, where the plant grew indigenously, and that means it's the most authentic, and which is called geo-authenticity, means it has the most efficaciousness in the plant. Most of those areas are impoverished places around the world. So we're spending a lot of, we, we, there's uh, 2,000 kids went to school today at a traditional medicinal school 
uh, and they got a hot meal, they got a bike to ride to work, they got a uniform, and we paid for the teacher. So gosh, how do you get your return on that? Well, you know what? Those communities were also doing agricultural work and we're working with the families and we're getting really high quality set aside, which is in our laxative tea, and we're buying about 15% more every year. And so we actually, I actually think it's, it's a, the return on investment is there. It's not always black and white and, and, and stuff, but I think that, um, that, that that's, that's what we're committed to as a company. We are an intensely mission-focused company, mission-driven company. So we uh, have 99.8% of our ingredients are organic. They're all GMO-free. They're all medicinal quality. About 40% of them are socially certified. And we do this kind of stuff all the time, and it's just how we do business. And, and um, I think the other part that's really important for you guys as you go to work for companies is just to ask those questions at your employers and where are things coming from. I'd say 90% of the work traditional medicinals does is just because we show up. If you showed up in these communities and you saw what $5,000, we can open an entire school, bikes, uniforms, hot lunches, teachers, for $15,000 in the Rajasthan Desert, $15,000. You know, and then people call me up and they want money for, I don't know, the gift of life or something or some program, which is also good programs. And I'm like, gosh, how do I, how do I balance those things, you know? And so um, the, the world needs companies to care more about where things come from. I'm gonna ask you a marketing question. Because sure. I just find this fascinating. I've been, a, a, as I said, a huge fan of traditional medicinals since I moved to Sonoma County and started doing the vegetarian stuff. Um, and I've always had your teas. And I've noticed that there's always been, and with my MBA, learned about product placement and all of that work that gets done in grocery stores and such. I, I've noticed the trend of seeing traditional medicinals in some of the major departments, major stores, and then it goes away, and then it might come back, and maybe just a couple of the teas show up on the shelf. And I'm specifically thinking about Safeway. We used to have a huge display of traditional medicinals, and I, I don't even remember how many years ago, and now you go, they've got maybe four or five of the top sellers. And I'm just curious about how that decision gets made. Is it because of what's selling on the shelf? Is it because of what Safeway wants to sell? Oh, the, the combination of, mainly it's what Safeway wants, mm -hmm. like they're, they're the customer. So that's, in that specific example, we were the first, we were one of the first natural foods that Safeway ever sold in 1980. Mm -hmm. And for most of, the, most of Safeway's uh, uh, history, they've had a natural foods aisle. Mm -hmm. So let's say that was aisle number 22, okay? About 12% of the shoppers at, at Safeway go to the natural mm -hmm. foods aisle. So for 40 years, roughly, or 35 years, we were in the natural foods aisle with about 30 items. Mm -hmm and we sold a certain amount of product there. And like I said, 12% of the shoppers went to that set. And uh, when I became the CEO of the company, I'm the one who led the charge to say, I wanna be in the main aisle. Mm -hmm. and, and I want six to eight items in the main aisle, and I'll trade all 35 in the natural food set. Mm -hmm. And we sell twice as much, the, the eight items sell twice as much as the 30 items sold. Wow. Mm -hmm. If you're a shopper in Safeway, and you say, how long has traditional medicinals been in your store? About 90% of their shoppers, or 88% of their shoppers, will tell you three years, because we did that three years ago. Yeah. And we can go there from six to eight to 10 to 12 to 20, and someday we'll have 30 again. And so what we really made the decision to be is we didn't want to be in the little natural food set anymore. We wanted to be in the main TL. We wanted to be next to Bigelow and Lipton and Twinings. Because we're the fifth largest tea company in the United States, and most of our placements were all in natural food stores or in the natural food set at the grocery store. And you know, I guess I, 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 with my team, really led this bold move to say, hey, we, I, I, want, I want a seat at the table. And we were about the 10th largest tea company in the United States, and now we're fifth. So we, we, just, we, we just put it out there. I mean, I went to Publix, and you know, it's just fun to be a CEO. And I, in this regard, I, you know, I, I did the same thing in Publix. And she's like, you're going to trade 30 items? And I was asking for two. I said, you know, in my natural foods world, um, People think I'm a successful guy because I'm the CEO of Traditional Medicinals. But gosh, um, Publix sells 7.8% of all the groceries in the United States and I don't even have one tea in your tea aisle. I don't think I'm very successful at all. Help me be successful. Mm -hmm. So we now sell about 18% of all the tea at Publix. Wow. Wow. The time has come for natural foods. 
in our company's probably biggest problem, the, the best decision that traditional Mitchells made was not hiring me, but hiring an outside CEO to come in who embraced the mission, but also saw the company with objective eyes. Because when you go from being a 27-year-old kid, our founder, to being a 60-year-old guy, in, in those 40 years, you look at your whole life from that to today. And I came in and said, I'm looking at it for today, and I'm going to the moon. Mm -hmm. And that was hard for him to see, because he was already in the stratosphere where we are today relative to when he was 27 years old. And so our team came in, and I started hiring people from Kimberly Clark and Kellogg's and Coke and Pepsi, and we've tripled the size of the company. We haven't changed one formula, haven't changed one ingredient supplier, and we've tripled the size of the company because we're going out there and saying, hey, the American public wants this product, and we're gonna, we're gonna get out there, and we're gonna, be, we're gonna compete with Lipton and Bigelow, and we deserve a seat at that table. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, it's been super, Super fun. I, I, my title is the CEO, but I'm, I'm the, the steward of Drake Sadler's dream. Mm -hmm. It's an honor. Mm -hmm. So internationally, um, other than like Canada, maybe some sales through Amazon or anything like that, is there a strategy for traditional medicinals or intentionally? Yeah, so, so our, our teas are all dietary supplements. So if you look on the back of a box of Kellogg's Corn Flakes, or bit better yet, the back of a box of Bigelow Tea, it says nutrition facts, just like it does on the back of, back of a box of uh, Kellogg's Corn Flakes. They're foods. You look on the back of a box of traditional medicinals and it says supplement facts. We're a dietary supplement, like a vitamin and a mineral. So we, so every country has its own regulatory environment for that. And to sell tea for $2.75 a box that retails for five forty nine, dollars it just doesn't make any sense for us. It's a, in the UK, it was $100,000 per SKU to get a license to sell, and plus we had to have a whole bunch of re regulatory people on board every day. And so that's, a, that's one limitation of, our, of selling dietary supplements. You really can't sell in other countries. Mm -hmm. We do sell in Canada and Mexico because we've taken the effort in those countries to go through the whole regulatory environment. Um, but, but, and, and we probably will do more in the future, but that's a big limitation. Versus an Amy's can sell a pot pie just about anywhere. Yeah. So, yeah. Yes? Um, what type of questions do you suggest that um, we would ask if we're interviewing at a prospective employer? Uh, I, what do you like to see? I, I think that you need to ask everything. I'll tell you what, if they don't ask anything about you personally, then they don't value that. So that's one thing I would, I would say. Um, but try to learn about how they value people. Try to learn about what's the company's strategy. Is it profitable? Is it... Uh, is it uh, who owns it? Uh, what's the plan for the company in five to ten years? How are you going to get financing to grow? Kind of like an MBA case, right? And, and I tell you, no one's going to give you a hard time for that um, because you're a talented person and, and, and uh, you need this is my so I have a little uh, free uh, I tell you, I'll, I'll tell this I tell to anybody I speak with. I drive home from work every day from 5:30 to 6:15. There's nothing that will ever be on the radio that will be more interesting to me than talking to you about your career. If you ever want to call me, about 50 people a year take me up on it. My back of my car is usually full of resumes, and, 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 and I love to talk to people about their careers. And the number one thing that I, for free, of course, you know, I'm just, it's, it's just, uh, I'm a happy guy. If I can have one person be as happy as me, it's worth it all. Um, and so, um, the biggest mistake that I see people making. It's not like, oh, I did this project at work and I failed and I got fired or it's, it's the number one thing I see is people not thinking math, right? And because it, because it, because they don't, it, it, the number one thing I say to them usually is, okay, you were doing that, doing that. Why'd you take that job? Well, my, I, I didn't really like my boss at this job. And then I saw that job on Craigslist. I'm like, are you kidding? Like that's, that was why you took the job, you know, because it was an open job. Like, I'm, it's easy, easier said than done, but you know you need to say I want to work for traditional medicinals. I'm going to call everybody I can until I get an informational interview, and I'm going to find a way to work there because my entire life prepared me to work there in marketing, and this is why. And you do that for companies, you're going to get a job there. Mm -hmm. Like people want to hire people that are smart, that have really thought through the interview process, that have really thought through why they want to work there, and and. Uh, you know, cover letters are becoming sort of a, I don't know, maybe old fashioned or something. But I can tell you, as a person who hires a, a lot, they're really impactful. Mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, so, what I, so, so people like, my wife's a psychologist, so she would tell you, you know, she doesn't cure anybody, people only cure themselves. I say the same thing about my little career consulting business. I don't, I, 
not telling anybody what to do, I'm helping them tell themselves what to do. And I've had so many people call me and be like, wow, you've changed the whole trajectory of my life. I didn't realize that this was what I was good at. Now I'm going like, like, I didn't do that. You did that. <laughs> you know, I've had people like, you know, when I terminate somebody at work, I spend more time telling them what they're good at and what they should be trying to do in their life than firing them, telling them what they're bad at. Everybody, unless you steal from your company, you never really get fired. There's opportunities and there's skill sets. And they just kind of always mixing and matching and moving around the world. That's, that's what job, that's how it works. It's good, it's healthy. And so when, whenever we have to terminate people, I always spend the time to show them and talk to them about what they are good at. And I can't tell you how many people have come to me years later and thanked me for firing them. <laughs> and, and again, I hate to even use the word firing them, but you know, just kind of having to terminate them, but to try to put them on a path because everybody is good at something. It's just lining that thing up. And sometimes it lines up and then it gets misaligned. And sometimes people don't do a good job interviewing on each side, but but my number one piece of advice to all those 50 people I talk to every year is, you're smart, be picky. You know, you got to be pickier about who you go to work for. Yes? Can you talk more about your personal board of advisors that you have for your life and how you pick people and how you confer with them? And kind of you know, uh, I, I, so my guy, Scott Briggs, who told me uh, he hired me because I told him everything I didn't know. Um, he, he's, he's one of those guys. Um, uh, I, I just, I think when you, I just think in general, you, you know who the smart people are out there. And, and don't, you know, this sounds kind of trite or easy, but, you know, um, don't try to seek advice from people who won't give you advice. You know, like somebody who will come here at 7 o'clock at night to, to talk to you about their career is somebody who cares about their career, cares about other people's success. The person that you're calling 29 times trying to schedule a breakfast with that will meet with you, you don't want their advice anyway. You know, so it's a little bit, it's a little bit self-fulfilling, but so find the people, gosh, I just had some amazing, I was an auditor at uh, Ernst & Young, our largest client was a company called Gould Electronics, this was like in the 1980s, and it was a Fortune 200 company, and um, I was working late on the audit one night, we were always working late, and I went by the CEO's office, and uh, his name was Bill Ovalsacker, and this was a company that had like 30,000 employees, and uh, I just went by the door, and I said, oh, Good evening, Mr. Obelsacker. You know, I was like 23 years old. And he said, hey, who are you? And, and I said, oh, I'm up with the audit team. We're just working late. He's like, come on in. And he had this desk. It was like twice as long as this. And it was like, and he had a bathroom and jets, bottles all over. You know, the office was probably this big, literally this room. And he had a pile of papers on his desk, like this big. Like, I mean, like this high, and it was like twice as long as this. I was like, wow, you're a really smart guy. He said, oh. Tell you a little secret. He got really quiet. <laughs> he said, he said uh, you don't actually have to be smart to be a CEO. You have to make smart decisions. And I make them by listening to other people who are smarter than me. 22 years old. Fast forward 30 years. I'm in the family section at a small chapel in Palm Springs at his funeral because I was one of his closest friends. Oh. That's what life's about right there. It, it, it's, about, it's about that, you know? I went to his funeral and, and I, um, I uh, went to his house to talk to his housekeeper and his people were helping him and there's a picture of me, my last visit to him on his fridge. <laughs> Who would ever thought? Who would ever thought? Right? But, but, but so you just never know where those people are going to come up from, where they're going to come from, and and uh, some of it's your uh, Professor Gerling. My gosh, he should be at the top of your list, you know. Um, so I'm serious, you know, and and, and um, because he'll make the time for you, and he has a lot to offer, and he sees a lot, and and uh, you know, and just and I tell you, gratitude. I have this little ritual that I do. My shipping lady at. Uh, Traditional medicinals think I'm crazy, but every Thanksgiving I send out about 25 boxes of tea with a handwritten note to all my board of advisors. Wow. Every year they get it at Thanksgiving, and and uh, <clears throat> I always just say, hey, it's it's winter, it's time for some tea, and it's time for me to be thankful to you. And, you know, and wow. people love to be appreciated. They love to be thanked and appreciated, and and um, 
I guess I, I just again going back to that B student thing. I think all the answers are out there, and I and I'm I've always been seeking them, and so I've just made great friends with, with people, and and most of them will all tell me the same things. Um, I made a lot of mistakes. Let me help you not make some of them. Um, I work too much. The, 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 my, my best compliments I get from them are, I admire them greatly and they've been so good to me over the years. And the best, the biggest compliment they give me is how much they admire um, my personal life. That I have a wonderful wife and kids and I make time for them. And uh, you know, I have a thing on my Outlook calendar um, every Tuesday and Thursday, I take my kids to school. That means I get them up, I make the lunches, I do the whole thing. Um, and and, uh, and that's, my wife does that three days a week, so I'm not trying to make a big deal of it as much as like, make time for your kids, go to their school plays. And, and, and I, don't, I don't hide that at work, I flaunt that at work because I want other people to do the same thing. And, and so that's the, the, the best compliment they always pay me um, is that because they work too much. Now I work a lot, I work way too much. So it's not like I'm goofing around, but um, they didn't put as much balance. Maybe they got married and divorced two or three times. They spent too much time in their career and they let things go. And that's why, you know, I'm trying to learn from them and pass on information to the next generation of people who want to listen to me. I add that personal life really strong in there because that's a real thread that's really important. Your friends and your family and your, your, your own spirituality and your own rest and your balance, it's really, really important. It's really important to be successful. It's really important in your career. It's, it, one feeds the other and I think people think, oh, I'm just gonna need to work more. It's like, no, sometimes you need to relax more. You know, it's hard to do and it's a, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a constant battle. I think the one thing that's nice about your generation and me today and in, in your generation that was different than when I was your age is technology enables your work to be more flexible. When I was young, you had to be at the office. That's where you did your work. Mm -hmm. And now I can go to my kids' play and maybe I'm answering emails at 11 o'clock at night and I'm still working my 40 hours, 50 hours a week, but I can be more flexible. That's one thing that, even at my age, I, I think it's wonderful, but I think younger people have that that we didn't have when we were younger. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned the transition from working, um, you know, kind of your own individual work is kind of like defines your, your abilities when you're younger. And then you make this transition into your early thirties, where you have to get more work done for more people. Yes. So, do you have any words of advice for I, I, everyone going through that transition? I think it's it's huge. So, your 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 uh, typical thing is the person who's the best salesperson gets made the sales manager. That's typically not the person who's the best manager. Look at the San Francisco Giants. Okay, Bruce Bochy, sort of revered as one of the best managers in baseball last you know whatever ten years. Played catcher. It's a position where you see the whole game a lot more than other positions. He was okay at it, played professional baseball, wasn't great at it, but he played it. But uh, he, he knows how the game is played better than he knows how to play the game. Okay? So you need to be able to know that in your career. You need to be able to know how the company works better than how good you are at your specific skill set. It's a really hard thing to let go of. It's a really hard thing. I have uh, six direct reports, and, and each of them are smarter than me in their area of expertise. That's a hard, uh, the, the, the huge transit. So I always say administrators administrate, managers manage, and leaders lead. Huh, sounds pretty simple, right? They all rhyme, <laughs> but they're, they're completely different. If you're a manager, you are telling people what to do, and you're managing them. If you're a leader, you're hiring smart people and they're telling you what to do and you're leading them. If you're a leader, you work for the people. The best compliment I could ever get is for one of you to meet somebody from Traditional Medicinals in the next couple of weeks and say, hey, I heard this guy Blair talk. He seems like a nice guy. Must be, must be fun to work with him or work for him. And they'd go, well, technically, but he would tell you <laughs> that he works for me. Yes. Okay. I say at every employee meeting. I report to you guys. The, the, the day your job is not important is the day we're not going to have that job. My job is to make sure that the company's got a, a, a good strategic plan for the future that's developed by our team, and that's incorporated all of your thoughts into it, and that I'm removing obstacles for you to be able to do your job. I'm giving you the skills and the training to do your job and to get out of your way. That, I mean, I'm a servant leader. I'm in service to my company. I'm in service to my community. Um, that's what good leaders are. And so there's a huge difference between leadership and management. 
And, and that's a really hard transition for people to, to make because that's a hard thing to do. It's really hard to let that go. But boy, we, I, mean, I, I came to traditional medicines. I was the first, so they hire a CEO. There wasn't a management team. There wasn't, now I've hired about 55 people since then. Man, those 55 people, I mean, they're just getting tons of great work done. Tons of great work done. Blair can't do that. There's no way, right? And so, but you have to let go of that, and you have to be able to. I would say, like the, you know, for the CEO, the minimum requirement is you have to, um, you have to take blame for everything that goes wrong, and you have to give away credit for everything that goes right. That those are just starters. If you want to take credit for anything, you're not going to be a good leader. No way. So, because you're not really, you're not really leading if you're taking credit for what's going on. Your team is doing that work. And you do have to accept blame for everything that goes wrong. So that how are you at not taking them home, and how do you manage that? Uh, I, I think like that, that life-work balance part is, is hard. I think if you're if you're not wrenching about it and stressed about it, I mean that's just that's a little bit comes with the territory. If you want to be a leader, you know you're just not going to be able to turn that off. Um, that's the bad part about technology. Your whole life can be in your phone at 10 o'clock at night. All your work problems. Um, but I think that, um, I, 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 again, I go back to what Mr. Ovalsacker taught me when I was 22 years old. You know, I'm not required to make, to, to, I'm not required to have all those things figured out. I'm required to figure them out. And so I have that team around me and it's a lot more enjoyable now to make those decisions with my team than having to do it alone. And so I, I consult my board and I consult our owner and I consult my team and, and together we make decisions. One of my favorite things to do is when we have those tough problems and somebody has a solution that is, and it's in their area of expertise, and it's different than what I would do, and I say to them always, damn it, this is what sucks about hiring you. Now I have to listen to you because I wouldn't do that. And 99% of the time, I go back to them months later and go, see, you were right. That's hard, that, that's, that's hard to do. I tell you, leadership is not for control freaks. No. <laughs> it, just, it just isn't, you know. And there's a lot of people who are control freaks. I mean, we're all guilty of it to some degree or another, right? And our owner is a kind of, he's a wonderful human being, one of the most wonderful people I've ever met, but he's kind of a control freak, mm -hmm. right? And so he always had to have everything all around him. And it was finally when he realized his hand didn't quite get around the company anymore <laughs> that he wanted to hire a CEO because he only wanted to have it like this or he didn't want to do it because he couldn't get comfortable, mm -hmm. Amelia, with letting go, that he couldn't get comfortable with that. That was just too hard for him. So, so uh, but I give him a lot of credit for, for, for seeing that and allowing me to come in and allowing us to hire a team. But um, a group of people is always infinitely going to be doing better than any person. I mean, just, I, I, I don't, that, that's an easy one for me. And again, maybe it's because I was always not the smartest guy in the room, but I think that's an easy one. That, you know, that, that, that getting the group of smart people together. So and it's super fun to, uh, to, to see a group of people, you know, just really do great work together and, 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 and sort of step back from that and, and give that credit to other people and, and see the joy and the empowerment in, in them. I, it's just one of my greatest joys at work is, is seeing other people do really well. So there's, um, just as people become more educated on the health benefits of tea and not wanting soda anymore, I see companies like Coca-Cola buying out smaller companies like Honest Tea, but I'm sure you'd hope and pray that doesn't happen, but is there any talk of traditional medicinals ever going public, being bought out, or anything Sure, like that's that? a very normal question to get asked, and we get asked it uh, surely a lot, and then it probably doesn't not more than a week or two goes by without some investment banker calling, calling us. Yeah. Um, and what, what our founder has done is he, so he, uh, he still owns the majority of the company. The, the, he's got a few friends uh, that own uh, the, the, a, small, a small amount of it, <clears throat> and they're all pretty successful food entrepreneurs, so they're not looking for an exit. Most of them are giving the stock to their kids, and then if anything happens to him, our, our company goes into a foundation. So it's funny, um, so I, I've worked, spent my 20 years working for founders, which I could write a book with. Robert Gurley's always told me I gotta write a book about it. But it's, it's, uh, I worked for five different people. One was like a, the doctor, one was a Montessori school teacher, Jim Rosen. One was a, this doctor, the Daily Wellness Company, the Stanford doctor. Another was this crazy real estate guy who ran the health publishing company. Another was, uh, and then another was our founder, and another was, I guess, somewhat normal guy. Um, and, and, but but the, the point being, the five of them really different backgrounds, right? 
And boy, you put them behind a desk and you put them to work at a company, can't tell one iota from the other. <laughs> so it took me a while to figure that out. Now they're all wonderful people, they've employed me. I really, I feel like I'm, I'm a steward of their companies more than a CEO, but really kind of figured that, that, that whole piece out that, that uh, gosh, I'm losing my train of thought. Uh, what was the, what was? Yeah. Being bought out. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, so uh, but, uh, and, and so uh, that's a normal thing for, for people to, to want to do. And so would he, oh, I know, sorry, I know, and I'm back on track. So, so one of my things for founders is I'm always like, I'm trying to figure out, when I'm trying to get them to do things, I'm like, do you want to be rich or do you want to be famous? Well, they always say both. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, but you got to choose. And they always say rich. So, and the point being is like a lot of times I'm trying to make the right financial decision for the company. And so I'm forcing them to do what's best financially, not what's best for their somewhat inflated ego. So Drake, our founder, um, so I'm kind of coming to work here. I'm trying to figure out, you know, for him and I'm like, shit, he doesn't want to be rich or famous. He really doesn't, you know? <laughs> I'm like, my spike formula, it's not going to work. <laughs> and, um, and so I figured out what he, where his pinch point is with, with his ego and it's around his legacy. He wants to get up from his grave 150 years from now and walk down to 4515 Ross Road, Sebastopol, and make sure we're on mission. Mm -hmm. And so he's doing everything he can to secure after his death that this company stays on mission, which one of them is never going to be sold. And so uh, for him, if our company's worth $100 million, the meanest thing you could ever do to Drake Sadler would be to, to give him $100 million and take his company from him. I'm not sure Andy and Rachel Berner wouldn't be the same. Yeah. It's part of their identity. It's part of who they are. Well, we're at time. Okay. <laughs> thank you so thank much. You. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you.